Hey everyone, welcome to Home Therapy. It's your host, Anita Yokoda. This is the podcast where we break free from our negative thoughts about our home and ourselves. As a licensed therapist and interior designer, I'm committed to bring you raw, relatable, and revealing home therapy sessions to help renovate the real in all of us. But guess what? It won't be all serious business. I love having fun. So we're going to definitely include the ridiculously crazy and funny moments we all experience at home. From DIY fails to spontaneous paint jobs and even discussions on how to decide on a style with your partner, how to motivate your kids to organize their spaces. Sound familiar? I get it. Even as a designer, I'm right here with you, navigating through these challenges and sharing the journey. New episodes drop every Tuesday, so get comfy, sink into your couch, because this is the place to get your home therapy. One session at a time with me, Anita Yokoda. I am so thrilled to be joined by Sarah and Rich Combs, my wonderful friends who are the visionary creators and designers behind the Joshua Treehouse. Since 2015, the Joshua Treehouse has been a sanctuary for those seeking to reflect and reset. They host guests near Joshua Tree National Park in California and a charming inn bordering Segoro National Park in Tucson, Arizona. Sarah and Rich are literally the king and queen of masterfully blending the beauty of nature with thought design. And for me, embracing the imperfection as part of their philosophy is what magnetizes me to their designs and location. The environment feels so authentic and welcoming and customized. Let's delve into the story with Sarah and Rich. Sit back, relax, and let's get started. So I feel so honored that the both of you are here today. Thank you, Anita. We feel the same. Thanks for having us. Yeah. You're welcome. But (laughs) just so excited. There's so many um, burning questions I have. And obviously my whole perspective is from a therapist and a designer. When I step into your properties, I immediately calm down. I feel relaxed. And the most impressive thing about your style and design is the thoughtfulness, the intentionality behind the design. It doesn't matter if it's the bathroom to the communal areas. I just feel like you were one step ahead of me as a guest knowing what I needed to relax because I know most of your guests go there to relax. So I'd like to just dive into your design process. I know getting the property up to speed was full of challenges and things like that. But first, I'd love to just get into your brains about how you create intentional design. Well, we like to think about first the experience that we want our guests to have. And it's really sweet to hear that you felt (laughs) relaxed because that's one of the things that's really important to us. We feel like... The world is so chaotic and can be so busy. And one of the reasons that we started the Joshua Tree House is that we want to give our guests the time and space to just slow down and reconnect with nature and just be. Pay attention to the leaves outside or the light flowing into the room, things that we often don't have time to pay attention to. So we start off just thinking through that whole process of when our guests step into a space, We want them to feel reconnected with nature. We want them to slow down. And then when we are designing, we can go back to those goals and think through how can we answer that or how can we solve for this? So if we choose colors that reflect the outside environment, that can help reconnect our guests with nature. Or let's not do an instant coffee pot. Let's do a Chemex so people can reconnect with process and making something. And it's just tastes better that way usually too yeah and it tastes they really enjoy that or they really enjoy the 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 sound of the analog music they really get to appreciate those specific moments i do notice that all my five senses are energized when i'm there so do you guys also think of our body's reaction our our sensory mode is is that part of your design absolutely yeah before we were doing this we were web designers in san francisco and we really enjoyed coming more into like the real world and adding more senses to design for 
like how people can touch a specific space or smell, as Sarah said, the light coming into the rooms and how we can play with those different senses. Yeah. And natural materials come into play a lot with that because they are so textural and they also wear in beautifully over time. And so we don't want people to feel like you can't touch this or you can't interact with that. It, we want it to feel the more that you interact with it, the more beautiful it becomes. It's meant to be used. We want you to lay back on the couch and snuggle up with a blanket and read the books and interact with the space it's meant to be something to look at. It's something to be in and experience. I remember you sharing your story. I don't know if both of you are from the East Coast, but I don't think either of you originally are from the desert, but you had no. visited here and then that started the whole journey for the Joshua Tree House and then the Posada, right? Yeah. yeah. So could you tell the listeners and I, what about the desert and designing that kind of natural energy really attracted you? Yeah. So we, uh, we grew up in Connecticut, which is totally different climate, totally different so environment, landscape, uh, very lush green and very cold in the winters. We started dating when we were 15. So we grew up with each other there. And then after we went to college, we knew we wanted to move to California because we wanted to be yeah, warmer. Sure, sure. Wanted to I'm from Seattle, so I totally get it. Once we first came down to the desert, we were just so in love with it. Like the first time that we went to the desert was Palm Springs. I think it was for our, one of our anniversaries. And we just immediately fell in love with it. We were just like kids experiencing this new landscape and climate. And I think it was August. So it was like so warm, but we just loved it so much. Oh yeah. That feeling of being out under the stars and it, the air feels like bath water. We had never really experienced that before not being cold at night. It was a novel thing. So yeah. Cause in San Francisco, it's kind of cold. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It yeah. can be gray and, and overcast, but not the desert. Yeah. Yeah, so it just made us feel so curious and we really liked feeling that way again. It made us feel more creative and also got us to slow down too and have longer conversations, even with somebody at the grocery store or something like that. We were really appreciating and felt like the more that we're able to slow down and reconnect with nature, then the, in turn, the more that we care for it too. So that's kind of a even broader goal behind give our guests the space to relax and reset is to reconnect with nature and take care of the earth because it's precious and it can be easy to forget when we're all moving so quick. And for some listeners who are fascinated by conservation and nature, what about nature for you both? Why is it such an important topic for the both of you? Was there any moments, pivotal moments, or was it just more of a slow progression of just like having this main goal of cons conservation? Growing up on the East Coast, you just, you kind of take water for granted a little bit and it, the climate is just very different. But then since moving to California, we've been exposed to droughts and different unique weather patterns and stuff like that. Since we've moved out to the West Coast, just being in that sort of environment and hearing more about that and seeing like how we could just do these different things that can really impact the world in many different ways. I think that has made us more conscious of the environment. And then since moving to the desert, you see how that ecosystem is very fragile. And that's also with climate change, like one of the, like the Josh tree could disappear if the temperature keeps rising you really see the impact of how you, like your actions affect the climate. Yeah, I totally agree. Growing up in Seattle, we're surrounded by water. And even I remember in third grade, they were talking about the aqueducts going from Washington state to California. And the joke was they were stealing our water, but um, <laughs> you know, like I just, but now I've lived in California longer than my home state. And I too had been very aware of, the droughts and conservation. And as you know, I share that passion to conserve. And so I think that's one of the reasons why I was so drawn to your design and homes, because I know you have that in mind. How <laughs> and homeowners, listeners who want to bring in nature and want to bring in the desert energy, but maybe they don't live in Southern California or some place more dry, like say they are in Boston or Connecticut, how can they bring in that sense of desert and calmness? Do you have any suggestions of 
how they can bring that in? Well, I feel like each place should be designed for the landscape that it's in. And so it's reconnecting with the environment that you do live in. Say if we were in Connecticut or New York, maybe we are bringing in more of that landscape color palette in the summertime, maybe some of those bright greens or blues from the water. I don't know. It's just... The wood choices would be different. Wood choices would be different, more to the local varieties of trees that are growing there and thinking about the history of each place. And so pulling in, we love using vintage or antique pieces because they have such a story to tell. And so going around to local thrift shops or vintage places and pulling pieces that are from that place just makes it feel so special and I think it's a nice way to slowly pull a place together even though sometimes our projects are on a tight timeline we really do try to go and find pieces that we're not just ordering it all online to really bring that sense of place yeah I think what we try to do we try to find like a really good balance between if we just on that note of ordering things online right if we buy something new, we also try to buy things that are old at the same time to try to add more story and character to the place. I'm not right. saying it's like one for one, but we try to like kind of keep that somewhat even. I definitely yeah. notice that immediately when I walk into your properties is there is a lot of vintage items and some of them can be so tiny, but again, <laughs> so intentional and thoughtful. Like I just feel like did they get into my head? You know, like I just felt like you guys were always one step ahead of the guest in helping them to slow down. I'm an Aries. I'm just a very go, go, go kind of person. And so I really appreciate that I yearn for slowing down. And so I love visiting your properties or just having conversations with you about slowing down how do the both of you slow down? Because I know you have a two-year-old and that can be very busy, running a business mm -hmm. together. Any go-to ways that the both of you relax and slow down? Yeah, I mean, honestly, sometimes when we're, we can be very go, go, go too. And so we're working on these projects and thinking, this is ironic because we're trying to create spaces for people to slow down and yet we're moving so fast. Maybe we can enjoy it one day. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but... You know, I think even though it can be so chaotic having a toddler, she also does get us to slow down because we might have all these ideas for what we're going to do that day. And then she's just not having it. And it's like, okay, let's all go out on a walk. And then she likes to stop and smell the creosote and look at the birds. And it's like, okay, yeah, this is actually, we do need this. So she reminds us to do that all the time. Yeah, it helps. It helps her too. So mm -hmm. it's good for all of us. It is. And then because we split our time between Tucson and Josh Tree, both locations, like in Tucson, we have various trails that go throughout our property. So we can easily just kind of like walk around those getting out in nature. And then we also border the national park here. We can easily just hop into the park and do whether it's a quick hike or a, a longer hike. There's many different options there. So that that helps a lot. And then we're also lucky that we live in a, in a part of Josh Street that we can just easily just walk out in nature and climb boulders and um, being outside is everything enjoying the sunset. I totally yeah. agree. Uh, there's days where I can easily be inside for two days and, and realize, oh my gosh, I didn't, I haven't been outside except maybe to the grocery store, but I've actually included into my routine because now we have two dogs. If you can believe it or not, like what, so that was not on my bingo card, but we, we got two dogs in two years and one is special <laughs> needs he's like 90% blind and oh. they've taught me to just in the middle of the day, like I need to take a break at 12 o'clock. That is my routine to go outside, take them out for a little walk. It's good for them and it gets me out. So I love the idea of like, it doesn't have to be a full hike. It could just be a little quick walk with your toddler. For me, it's a quick walk with my dogs, but going out and getting nature, I think that vitamin D that we all lack, it's important to increase our serotonin and dopamine levels that way. My dopamine level just increased three times just by stepping into the Posada. Besides getting into nature, are there indoor ways 
to slow down for people who do during the winter don't have the luxury of sunshine, you know, like the East Coast or the Pacific Northwest, the Midwest, a lot of times the winter is harsher. Do you have any advice of slowing down and, and getting those doses of energy or serotonin inside? Yeah. I mean, even on the craziest of days, if we don't get a chance to go outside for some reason, if we can just look outside and see the sunset, that could be so helpful. Also something like lighting a candle or reading a book, being able to do something tactile, maybe sketch a little something or even just write something with a pencil because so often we're typing or texting, being able to do something a little more tactile like that, putting on a record. Just encouraged me to take a pencil and just maybe free write or sketch. You don't have to be a great artist or a great writer, Mm -hmm. but I think research has shown that that writing down thoughts, well, that's why journaling is so helpful, releases your brain. It's a good habit and also it releases happy hormones in your brain. So I really love these ideas. That's very, very helpful, even for me. I feel like the both of you are always so chill. Like Sarah and Rich just get along so well. I've had 20 years of doing this couple therapy, but I'm like, oh, Sarah and Rich are just like my shining example of like working together. But you know, how, what is your secret? Is there a key to your communication together? Yeah, I think maybe I just think of everything in terms of parenting a toddler right now, mm. but when our daughter's name is Flora. So when Flora is really upset, we can't talk to her about anything logical in that moment. So we have to wait until she cools down. And after we go on a walk or something, then maybe we can share with her what we were trying to get across before. And so I think we're all the same. We're, you know, adults, we, we all have some of that toddler in us. And so if we're feeling worked up about something, we can't talk about it in that moment. But once we've had a little time and space to think it through, then we can come back and have a more clear, calm conversation together, Mm -hmm. work back and forth between what does make the most sense. And then sometimes we're just like completely on the same page. A lot of times it seems like we're completely on the same page and we can guess what the other one would do in that situation. But occasionally it's just comes from right field and we have no idea like why (laughs) the other person did that thing. Yeah. But ultimately I think we go by the nothing is permanent mentality. And so let's just try it. Nothing's permanent. We can change it later. And that really helps most decisions. You can, you can change it later on if it's not working out. I don't know why that's going to make me cry. Like I love that so much because (laughs) usually our human reaction is very finite. And that's why clients with renovation projects get so freaked out. It's like, they are paralyzed by decisions based on the fact like this is going to be forever. This tile is going to be forever in my house, this lighting, And it's more of a limiting belief that this decision will impact me to infinity. Whereas what you just said, God, just like that mind shift. I don't know why that strikes my heart of my soul. Oh, that's amazing. I'm I'm really going to hang on to that guys. So nothing is permanent in the good sense. There's nothing we really need to freak out about everything works out in the end things always work out that is that a mentality you take into your diys because i know a lot of things obviously need to be professionally done i remember you telling me stories because of budget doing some diys is this also the perspective you have for projects yeah it's definitely a lot of that mentality i think starting a DIY with fear of, oh no, if I don't do it perfectly, this is going to be here forever. I think that's setting ourselves up for disaster. We go into it knowing it's not going to be perfect. And that's part of also what makes it beautiful. It's handmade and it has a story to tell now. And we're also going to learn so much through each DIY process. And that's a huge gift in itself and every time that we do one then it gives us more knowledge to be able to talk to our contractors for the next time that we're working on something like that Mm -hmm. so it is so incredibly helpful and there's ones that we did way back in the beginning that now we're going to have to redo because we didn't do it the proper way and it's it's just part of the process yeah you just you just keep on learning you do the best you can in that moment i 
I'm constantly looking at our old projects being like, man, I really wish I did it this way or that we did it this way or that we chose this material instead. But the more projects you do, the more refined they get in many ways. But as Sarah said, you still get that DIY or handmade texture and story to it. Do you guys have a favorite DIY project that brought you closer as partners or just special core memories? Well, a really special one was working on the Joshua Tree House kitchen. We decided a couple of years back to redo the whole thing, but we didn't have very much time. So we planned it all ahead of time. And then we got in there, me, Rich, and Rich's dad. So it was really nice bonding time with his dad, too. And in 11 days, we redid the kitchen and it was so crazy, but really satisfying at the end to have turned this space, completely transformed it in a little less than two weeks. But for sure, having that timeline, it also makes things a lot more stressful and tiring because we were going from the time we woke up until late at night and then rinse and repeat. It was really sweet because we got so many stories from Rich's dad that we hadn't heard before. Rich's mom and sister would come and bring us meals. It was a really sweet experience. We learned so much again on that one too. We were pouring concrete counters together and installing drawer fronts and making mistakes, but tiling, figuring yeah. it out as we went, tiling the floors. Yeah, yeah, that was a really, really awesome one. As Sarah said, it's like very stressful, like putting a timeline on things like that. Like this is going to be done in 11 days, but it also makes you get it done. Whatever time you have allotted for it, you're going to find a way to get it done in that time. There's, there's no time to procrastinate. <laughs> no, yeah. which is good. <laughs> Should we have done it in 10 days? <laughs> oh, God. oh my goodness. For me, the new mantra is imperfection is the new perfection. Like if just that slow living, what is your advice for someone who longs to start incorporating slow living, but still struggles with that perfectionistic mindset? Hmm, that is a good question. It could be something as simple as getting a plant. Plants, they're so beautiful but they're not perfect. I think it brings so much beauty to taking care of something in your home. And it does remind you to slow down and water, or maybe pay attention to, oh, is it getting a little bit too much sunlight or, but it's, it's okay. There is no perfect plant. So maybe something like that, or getting used to using more natural materials in your home. So say your, your table gets a scratch in it learning to see the beauty and it being more beautiful now because of it, using the chance to slow down. And we really think the Japanese method of kintsugi is really beautiful, repairing something with a gold leaf. And mm -hmm. that's a nice way to slow down. Something's broken, but instead of tossing it, you slow down and repair it and then appreciate it even more. I think there's a lot of beauty to be found in that kind of thing. Yeah. I've got a, pile of ceramics in our kitchen right now that I have to do because you of a lot Laura. of broken ceramics right now. <laughs> oh my goodness. Oh, but at the same time, it's an opportunity, like what you said, flipping the script, right? So instead of seeing something broken that you're going to throw away, it's, oh, how do I turn this repair process into something productive and a growth mindset versus a perfectionistic mindset. Both of you really inspire me every time I'm with you or I see your work on social media to hearing your interviews or just being with you right now. It's such an encouragement to continue my journey of learning to slow down and adopt a, a mindset that's just far more freeing, right? We can be more vulnerable and authentic at home when we adopt these ideas versus I have to have that perfect magazine worthy home. So thank you so much for your time and your advice and experience. I hope you can come back sometime. Yeah, we yeah, hope we get to see you soon too. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Home Therapy with Anita Yokoda. If this episode resonated with you, consider passing it along to a friend, family member, coworker, or roommate. Spread the love one home therapy session at a time. New episodes of Home Therapy are released every Tuesday. Subscribe to this podcast and never miss an episode. To leave a rating or review of the show, head to Apple Podcasts and let me know what you think. I love hearing from you. 
Not to mention, you can stay in touch with me throughout the week seeing behind the scenes info and sneak previews of upcoming guests by subscribing to my website, anitayokoda.com. All information about today's show and guests will be linked in the description of this episode. Thanks again for listening. I adore our time together so much, guys. Let's keep our intentions focused and calm. And as always, use your home as therapy.